thank everyone for being here, all the participants. I'm going to make this as brief as I can and go through what I need to. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the restaurant Boatyard for giving us this beautiful, uh, awesome view and ambience and great food. I, I think when we think of South Florida, the lifestyle of living, when we, we're selling this to our customers, we're telling them they're thinking of the boating, they're thinking of the view, they're thinking of the sunshine. And this is what this is all, it's all about. And I have to say, personally, when I moved away from Miami and after Andrew killed my house, I got homesick. I got homesick for this view, and that's why I'm back here and very happy to be. I do want to recognize that we have our great, uh, or a lot of members of our Broward Board of Governors and Ambassadors. So if I would ask the governors and ambassadors for Broward Miami to stand and be recognized, please. So, without any further ado, I'm going to get to our moderator for today, which is certainly not me. It is Miss Sophia Allen. She is a familiar face throughout South Florida, broker owner of the real estate professional serving families and investors uh, from all across the region. Sophia was the 2021 Women's Council Realtor Broward President. <laughs> But for me, most importantly, she's the current governor of the Broward Miami Board. <laughs> Sophia, it is now all in your capable hands. Thank you. Hello, 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 everyone. Happy Wednesday. I'm so excited to have you all here at the Bolt Yard. We have such an amazing panel. And we actually, we have three panels today are some of the most visible faces, faces around the great community. And independently, they have received numerous recognitions. So in the interest of time, I'm going to give you just a very quick bio for each, since these leaders truly need no introduction. Mayor Dean Chantillis was first elected as mayor of Fort Lauderdale in 2018 and won again in 2020. He has also served as vice mayor as well as city commissioner. A Connecticut native, Mayor Trentillis did his undergraduate at Boston University and received his law degree from Stetson. A consistent champion for Fort Lauderdale, Mayor Trentillis has been honored with countless accolades for his leadership and for our community. Please welcome and join me, Mr. Mayor Dean Trentillis. In her role, Jenny oversees projects that require close collaboration with federal, state, and local governments and diverse industry stakeholders. Prior to joining the DEA, Jenny was the director of the Sustainable Development Department for the City of Fort Lauderdale. Jenny graduated from the University of Colorado and is a graduate of the Fort Lauderdale Chamber's Leadership Program, as well as Leadership Broward's Women Leading Women Broward Program. Jenny recently was received with the prestigious Carolyn Michaels Award from the Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. Please welcome and join me, Ms. Jenny Morimon. And last but certainly not least, we have the founder of the Probes Group, Megan Probes, is an award-winning leader with over 10 years of experience in her real estate sales and consulting. Megan is a board member of the Miami Association of Realtors. Miami Association of Realtors! The largest local real estate association in the nation, as well as a member of the prestigious invitation-only Master Broker Forum. And get this, everyone, in just the past two years, Megan Probst has done an impressive 71 million solid and pending sales. Please welcome the amazing Megan Probst. Now, that's an impressive group. Am I, am I, am I right or am I right? We will start with the mayor, Mr. Mayor. Please give us some updates on the area and some key highlights of what's going on in Fort Lauderdale. So a lot of fun things happening in Fort Lauderdale. As you can see, we are continuing with the downtown renaissance, trying to create a sense of place of urban experience that before the city has never really had. In addition, the city has partnered with a lot of private entities, rebuilding a lot of our institutions like the Aquatic Center, creating a new dive tower, the biggest in the world, 
Um, we've now partnered with the Panto organization where they're going to bring ice skating east side so families and friends can you know, enjoy a sport that so many thought was just left up to the northern places. We also have a new soccer stadium. Have any of you been out to Inter-Miami soccer, yes. right? You need to. I only saw four hands go up. Shame on you. We have, the, we have a premier venue for international soccer uh, and other kinds of sports that, that take place right here in Fort Lauderdale. These are the types of things that draw attention around the world and what brings the excitement to Fort Lauderdale. So what, that has, what has that done? That has allowed people like you to benefit from those who say, hey, I want to live in Fort Lauderdale. You know, we're tired of living up north. It's hard to get around. Taxes are so high. You know, we need to be at a place where we can relax and enjoy our lives, where our kids can go to schools that, are, that, we, can, that we can have faith in, and that we have an environment that's safe and clean and sunny like you see today. So that's why we're seeing the prosperity that we have today. And as a result, the city has a responsibility too, not just all the fun and glamour things, but the infrastructure that we need to build in order to sustain the kind of influx that we're seeing. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars over the next 10 years to rebuild our underground infrastructure, including water, sewer, all kinds of, of uh, stormwater projects that we have on the, on the uh, agenda moving forward. These are the types of things that sort of people take for granted and don't really think about. But here in Fort Lauderdale, we've seen enough of what taking for granted means, and we can't take anything for granted. We have to be ahead of the game, ensuring that, that the homes that you move into are going to be safe and are going to be available to those who want to turn their faucet on and know water's coming out of there. So these are the kinds of things that are important to us as a city commission. But along with that, along with the popularity, you probably think, well, you know, People drive cars and there's a lot of traffic. And so we're doing our best to try to find ways to minimize the traffic concerns that we have in our community. I mean, no matter where you go in Florida, especially along the coastlines, there's always going to be traffic. And so what can we do as a city to try to mitigate those traffic concerns? One of the reasons that we're building our downtown is to create an environment where people can live there they can work there, they can shop there, they can do everything they want without getting into a car. That's the goal. That's what's called a sustainable urban downtown. And that's what we're trying to do as we're continuing to build our downtown environment. But to the extent that people live here and want to work in Miami or want to work in West Palm Beach, we've been talking with folks about, um, about a, a coastal link, a train system that augments the current Bright Line station, uh, the system that goes from uh, West Palm through Fort Lauderdale down to Miami, so you can live in Fort Lauderdale and you can work anywhere along that route. Wouldn't that be great? You wouldn't have to use your car, you wouldn't have to get on 95, you wouldn't have to pay $12 for that, that uh, toll lane that will only get you there when you're, when you're late to work. So we've been talking with uh, the Florida Department of Transportation and the county, and um, there's been a little hiccup, you may have heard, that we have a river that's sort of in the way. <laughs> And we want to keep that. Yes, we want to keep the river. So we're talking about options. You know, what's the best way to cross that river? And the City Commission of Fort Lauderdale has decided that there's no other option other than to build a tunnel through the city. Right? See, the people in Miami don't know what I'm talking about. But they let me tell you. Yeah, they, they need tell us. Trust me, Mayor Francis Suarez and I are on the same page and we're constantly talking about the need for tunnels in South Florida. Fort Lauderdale was the first city in the entire state, in the history of the state, to have a tunnel. We know it here, the Kinney Tunnel. So we know that the technology is there. It's not, a, it's not rocket science. And we have people that are interested. And why is the tunnel so important? Let me explain. Because if we build a bridge, it's going to create a two-mile barrier, a wall, right through the middle of our redevelopment area. That would crush neighborhoods that, are, that have been developing over the years and, and deny future investment who are giving a second thought about whether or not they want to invest in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Who wants to live in a building and see the train rumbling outside your window every day, 25, 50, 100 times a day as these trains travel up and down these tracks? So this, that's the issue. You probably wanted to know what the big deal was about. That's the big deal. It also creates a wall between neighborhoods where people who live on this side of the tracks and those on the other side of the tracks have been for so many decades and generations uh, divided. We want to connect communities. We want to open green space. We want to make sure that people don't feel left out of the, of the prosperity 
and the dignity of living in one Fort Lauderdale. So those are the real issues that we're facing. Construction costs, social costs, all of those have to be weighed. And that's what the Fort Lauderdale City Commission is doing, and we're doing it to make sure that when you sell Fort Lauderdale, that you're selling a city that's going to be sustainable and prosperous into the decades ahead. Because you're telling these folks how great it is to live in Fort Lauderdale, I'm telling you that we're gonna make it happen. So thank you, and I think that's a summary of what we're doing in Fort Lauderdale. Sound good? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm so glad you touched on the tunnel because I actually have a question about that a little bit later, but we'll get to that a little bit later. But I would love to hear from Ms. Jenny Morihon on the updates from the DDA. Thank you. You know, it's, it's really my pleasure to have sat next to Dean for the past 15 plus years um, following you know, the vision and the guidance. It really takes strong leaders in roles that matter to move a community forward. And so to be able to work on these important projects together, to see you know, your bold vision and your willingness to stand out there and fight for what's right for our community is really impressive. Um, and it's allowing you know, the city as a whole to grow, uh, downtown to grow. We've been working on this downtown really for several decades and COVID only accelerated the trends that we were seeing before it laid um, you know, the, the plans in place, it, it pushed those forward. Um, you know, when COVID happened and everyone kind of went dark for a minute and said, what are we going to do? There was a real thought that cities were no longer going to be places where people wanted to live or invest or work. And around the country, leaders in positions like mine, we came together and we really started to say, how can we collaborate? to make sure that cities remain front and center as destinations for growth and investment. And what we know is that capital follows talent. And talent is focusing in on the place. And our place needs investment. And it needs that investment through the public sector, through the private sector, through the real estate development. And so in the past two years, what downtown has experienced, an almost 20% increase in population, 40% over the past decade, but 20% in the past two years. I mean, the number of people that are choosing this place, the Goldilocks of South Florida. <laughs> we have the energy, the sophistication of both Miami and Palm Beach right here, and we have access to everything within a half an hour. So downtown truly, Fort Lauderdale, is the center of it all. And we had to really express how important it is that downtowns matter. They matter to a larger community, the neighborhoods that surround the urban core, the county seat. Downtown Fort Lauderdale only makes up about 4% of the city's land area. But it has a $30 billion annual impact. That's like hosting a Super Bowl every weekend. It's a third of the county's GDP in terms of economic impact. If we don't keep investing in downtown Fort Lauderdale, the county, the city, and the region fall short. It's been so exciting also to see kind of the change of the demographics in downtown. We have about over a quarter of the population young professionals. No surprise there, 40% of the residents downtown have high wage, high knowledge jobs. Professional service jobs have grown despite the pandemic in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Our retail vacancy rates are lower than they were pre-COVID. The energy, the number of restaurants, one in four restaurants in the city are in downtown and they're growing. Hotels, now Fort Lauderdale in its urban core is the place where the visitor experience starts. Our beach is tremendous, it will always be a major asset, but now Fort Lauderdale has two opportunities to allow people to come and experience. And what happens when they come and visit? and they go on the waterway, they say, I'm moving here. It's been so exciting. And with this kind of change, we're seeing bolder investments in architecture and the type of projects that are being built. We have national investors at the table. We have Kushner. We have a project at Searstown. These are five acre developments that are housing upwards of 800 units in bold, iconic transformational designs that are gonna allow these gateways into downtown to really be something special. You know, these civic investments that the mayor spoke about, some of them take decades in the making, 
We're so fortunate to see a new federal courthouse start construction on Tarpon River in downtown Fort Lauderdale after over a decade's worth of advocacy to get Congress to appropriate that money. And why is that important? So that a federal courthouse doesn't get built outside of the urban core? Those are jobs, those are additional investments that we're gonna see in an area that has nothing but opportunity to grow. We believe that a joint government campus between the city and the county is something really important. These are nods that when the public sector is investing in new forward-thinking buildings, the private sector is doing the same thing. And it also transforms an area that was underutilized. So we're so excited to see how downtown is growing, about 10,000 new units on the horizon to be built, a, a million square feet of office space, 600,000 square feet of new commercial and another 1,000 hotel rooms, all potentially within the next decade. This is how really you transform the core of a downtown that over the past 20 years has been evolving, but now is on an exponential track. So the brand of Fort Lauderdale, it's relaxed, it's approachable, elegant, sophistication, it's nautical, it's, <laughs> it's Dean. <laughs> You know, this is exciting. So it's, it's such a good brand that the county wants to call itself Waterdale. That's right. And, and you know, having a room full of professionals that are our brand ambassadors is really what allows us to keep moving this forward. So I'm really pleased to be here. I can't wait for some of the Q&A and dialogue. We'll get started. Now, of course, Megan, as a real estate professional, we want to know your take on what trends are you seeing? What updates can you give us as real estate professionals that have clients that want to move to the amazing Fort Lauderdale area? Wait, is it afternoon yet or is it still morning? Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to see all the familiar faces and new faces. And it's an honor to be here with you, Mr. Mayor, as well as Jenny, DDA. This is incredible. As someone who spent most of my life here in South Florida and who is a proud homeowner in East Fort Lauderdale, I am incredibly blessed to call this home. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, when I started my real estate career, actually, it was in the, the crux of Miami. So I started with a metropolitan city after coming back from New York. And one of the things 10 years ago that I struggled with in Fort Lauderdale was the, what we're seeing right now, the plan that you're talking about, the 10 years, 20 years of development coming into play. So when I had the opportunity to come back and focus my efforts in Broward County, I was pleasantly surprised. This is an incredible time. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity that we're experiencing here in Broward County. Uh, it's the first time that we're having incredible press about our market, the migration that's moving here, the inventory, uh, the lack of inventory. If you look at, um, I put together some of my points that I felt were super important about our market. That being the condo market, you're seeing just less than two months supply. You have the single family home market, roughly one month supply. We ended 2021 with a record median sales volume for single family and for condos. I mean, we sold 40,000 roughly volume in sales of homes in Broward County alone. Um, in terms of migration and what I'm seeing with my team specifically, you have, it's no longer that local market where people are expanding from their homes, as we all know that are in the market here and transacting. We are seeing the Northeast, the Midwest, California is finally making their way here, California. Um, the past, I would say, year that I've been working specifically in East Fort Lauderdale, the amount of business professionals that are moving their headquarters and their entire company here in terms of job opportunities and investments here. Resales market, I cannot even imagine. In 10 years, we are now, as you, many of you know, we have multiple offers on properties. I spoke to a colleague. Uh, they had 150 offers on a property. <laughs> okay, 150. Imagine going through all of those. So we have multiple offers, over asking, waving of appraisal contingencies, an influx of cash transactions I've never encountered before. Uh, so 
In terms of the robust market we're experiencing, it's certainly, certainly there. Um, in terms of the pre-construction sales, because our team focuses very heavily on new construction, uh, we don't have as many projects as Miami, but we have very thoughtful projects. And the in-house sales teams that I'm working with have never seen this before. I'm talking about in-house sales agents that have been working with Related and Fortune for 10, 20 years. I'll take Celine Fort Lauderdale, which is a culture development. They have two towers in Fort Lauderdale Beach. When they launched sales, they had 110 pre-construction reservations that came in. The developer stopped sales. I've never seen that before. He, he told his team, we must cool off, wait a minute. So for two months, they stayed in the sales center and they couldn't sell anything. Can you imagine that? Um, moving forward to uh, Four Seasons, we have signature projects. We already have the Ritz, but the Four Seasons is trading at 2,000 a square foot in Fort Lauderdale Beach. They only have seven units remaining, and they're opening the hotel in March, in early March. So we are no longer experiencing you know, the price per square foot that we, we I mean, that those, those days are, are gone, um, which is very exciting as someone who also works in Miami. Um, Alberge was a leader in Fort Lauderdale Beach. You had a 100 Las Solas in downtown which brought in the first hotel we haven't seen in 50 years, Hyatt Centric, which they have nothing available for rent there. They sold out. It was incredible watching that uh, being constructed from the ground up. So with the hotels and residential, we're also seeing the, re the retail as well as the hospitality sector. And as a foodie like myself, uh, I am so excited with the new offerings of restaurants that we're experiencing from Eddie V's, Yamas, you go along the Fort Lauderdale Beach corridor, please do so because we all work so much so sometimes we don't look up to see what's around us. You have restaurants opening up left and right. Just take a loop and you'll see. It's a very exciting time right now. Such, such amazing updates and information from all the panelists. And yes, I definitely agree with you because lately I have been much of a foodie, so the restaurants in Fort Lauderdale have been amazing. I would love to revert back to Mr. Mayor D when you mentioned the tunnels. It's so exciting to hear that. The only thing that usually I know that is a common question is what is the cost and will this be an increase with taxes? Thank you. So the cost has been a moving target. Uh, when the when the Florida Department of Transportation first um, was analyzing the cost between bridges and tunnels, they came back to us and they said, well, the bridge is going to cost about five to six hundred million, depending upon which bridge you go, um, and your tunnel is going to cost close to four billion. I said, what? <laughs> and um, so, anyway, we struggled with that and uh, we decided, hey, you know what, we ought to do our own research. And, uh, and so we did our own research. We started talking with companies around the world who build tunnels. And uh, we found out that that price was absolutely ridiculous. It was, and it was clearly intended to uh, throw us off, off our track to, to do the right thing for our city. So now we're looking at prices anywhere legitimately between 700 million and 1.2 billion. The FDOT says it's 1.8, but even that is 2 billion off their original estimate. So we're finding that we have, to, we have to really stay the mark. We have to really be involved in this debate because there are a lot of forces that just, the, the, the Department of Transportation does not build tunnels. They love bridges. They love bridges all over the place, okay? They wanted to build a pedestrian bridge a couple years ago over the, the river behind Las Olas Boulevard. No one asked them to do it, okay? <laughs> Somebody said, oh, we should have a pedestrian bridge because a few kids sometimes have to walk to uh, school and uh, they have to go around. And, and, and I said, well, it'd be cheaper to hire drivers you know, every single day than to build a, a $10 million bridge or whatever it was going to cost and maintain it every year for a million dollars. But there's more than just the train tunnel. There's the tunnel between the downtown and the beach. Why do we need that? Well, you heard what's going on downtown, and you heard what's going on down on the beach. 
There are multiple centers of activity and excitement here in Fort Lauderdale. And you also know the nightmare often that you face when you try to get between those two locations. Going down Broward Boulevard, going down Las Olas, it's a, it's a snail's pace. And a lot of people don't want to deal with that. In fact, most people don't. So we've been talking with Elon Musk and his company to build a tunnel from the downtown all the way to the beach that would end up at the Las Olas Oceanside Park. And it's a concept where, where Teslas are used with their drivers, and for five or six bucks, a, a car, not a person, would be driven from downtown all the way to the beach. You don't have to worry about parking, you don't have to worry about, um, about the time that it takes to get from, the time that it takes to get from one point to the other. And so the idea is to revolutionize transportation in Fort Lauderdale. We already signed an agreement with the company, with the Boring Company. We're now working out the logistics. And there's so many opportunities to continue to use their technology to try to move these concepts forward. So you'll hear more about these things, um, but we're really, uh, we're really at a point now with regard to the train tunnel where we're now talking with federal officials on how we're gonna start to fund it. And that's the key. So we're excited and, uh, and it will not cost taxpayers anything because you're already paying for it through your taxes. Meaning we passed a one cent sales tax for transportation a number of uh, two years ago. And part of the cost will come from there. Part of the cost will come from the federal government and part of the cost will come from the state government. So we're not raising taxes to pay for this. We're just using existing tax monies to pay for projects that were already intended for transportation. Megan, just to piggyback off of what Jenny was mentioning in regards to the new companies that are coming into Fort Lauderdale, what are you doing as a real estate professional to captivate and assist these um, relocation clients? It's a great question because I feel like that's, I, I should have changed my title to relocation specialist. Um, so actually during COVID, when it first hit, um, and as you mentioned, we all were figuring out where is this going, what direction is this gonna take? And thankfully because of the Miami Association of Realtors, we were quickly deemed essential. But during that time, I had to think, how am I gonna get myself out and about and active and, and just not focused on what was happening? So I started actually rollerblading and doing neighborhood tours. And that quickly, after about a year, I ended up just changing it into a little bit more professional uh, neighborhood tour. But those have been extremely successful. Because as um, they, you mentioned earlier today, you first have to sell Florida. But we don't have to do that anymore. Then it comes down to South Florida. Which county are they looking in? Um, so being able to put together a neighborhood guide or video um, to showcase what's actually happening is what has been super instrumental for me and my business. But most importantly, the Downtown District Authority has an incredible market report. And when I stumbled upon it two years ago, I said, wow, I cannot believe I'm not utilizing this. They have a residential report, they have a commercial report. The amount of stats and information, if you have not picked it up, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, and me, I live in actually Victoria Park, so I, I really encourage everyone who lives, whether you're in Broward, Miami, get involved in your local neighborhood association. I am part of the Victoria Park Homeowners Association. It's a $25 fee to be a part of the association. We have a monthly Zoom call that talks about everything that is going on. We have leaders that come on to our panel. Uh, we have a, a quarterly uh, magazine, which I appreciate your messages, Mr. Mayor, because they're very direct, very forward, very transparent. And then from there, you can get involved in the Chamber of Commerce, the CRA. We have so many resources available to really introduce our clients to the market. So that has been extremely helpful. Um, and also virtual tours, technology, that's the best way. They follow me on social media and they're jealous. They see that we, there was a quote that I just stumbled upon that said, work in the cloud but live in the sun. So that is what I just love about living in South Florida and being able to showcase our lifestyle because I actually, I love it, I'm excited about it, and this, again, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us as realtors. It's not going to happen again. It isn't.
That is amazing. And one more question. Um, this is one for is Mr. Mayor and Jenny in regards to the new constructions and the developments that are happening with Pier 66 and Holiday Park. Can you give us some update on what exactly is happening in that area? Pier 66 and Holiday Park? Yes. Okay, so in, in Holiday Park, you probably have noticed that there's new construction going on around the War Memorial Auditorium. And that is, that's regarding what I mentioned earlier, that the Panther organization has partnered with the city to completely remodel War Memorial so it'll be an entertainment venue. And in addition, they're building their headquarters for the Panther organization. Uh, they, they're building it by annexing uh, a building to the War Memorial building, as well as creating a practice ring for their team and a separate rink for the public to use. So that's the development going on in Holiday Park. In addition, the, the city continues to re refurbish all the sporting venues we have, our tennis venues. We're trying to add more pickleball in the city. Uh, we're working with somebody right now to add 40 pickleball courts, not in Holiday Park, but in Snyder Park. Um, uh, we're in an amazing transformation of unused real estate here in our city. Uh, with regard to Pier 66, you probably have seen a little bit of construction on the north side of 17th Street Causeway. Uh, the city and the developer, uh, Tavistock, have uh, agreed to allow them to build uh, their, their mid-rise uh, condominiums that are being built along the waterway. But they also have a proposal to build three towers that uh, ac actually exceed our zoning laws. So um, I believe they're uh, over, what is it, 400? They're over 500 feet tall. Uh, which exceeds the maximum that the city is allowed to build under the FAA rules of the, uh, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration because we're so near the airport. But, um, but you're going to see something there. Uh, it will happen. Uh, right now we're going to have the product that they're building now, which is really amazing luxury uh, condominiums that they're building along the waterway. It's beautiful, beautiful. They're redoing the entire Pier 66 Hotel. They're adding on to the hotel. Uh, they're going to designate the hotel historic once everything is completed. And uh, so it will continue to be an iconic yeah, image of the city. Um, but I just want to touch on something that what you had asked before about jobs. Um, Miami dazzles and makes everyone excited, and we get that. And that's why a lot of the, the tech industry has sort of been drawn to, to Miami. But there's a double-edged sword with tech industries. They pay well. Okay? And they also drive up the cost of living there. And I don't know if we can absorb that cost as, as well as Miami and Miami Beach can. Uh, you talked about uh, Four Seasons getting $2,000, $2,200 a square foot. Well, Miami Beach is getting $3,000, $3,500, maybe even $4,000 in some cases a square foot. You know, we're, we have an affordable housing crisis going on here. And we want to be able to provide housing to everybody who wants to live here and work here. So people in our hospitality world, uh, the workers in our hotels and our restaurants, can't afford $2,000 a square foot. So, so, but we are bringing other types of jobs. Future Tech is the tech industry which is located, they're taking their entire uh, headquarters out of Long Island, New York and moving it here to Fort Lauderdale. They've already moved it here. Uh, hundreds of jobs there. We did a ribbon cutting two weeks ago at the soccer stadium of a of, uh, global uh, sports uh, network, which is which is a training and school uh, that, uh, that 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 teaches sports professionals, uh, not so much the athletics part of it, but the business side of it. And and within five years, they plan to hire as many as 300 to to 500 people in that in that school, and there will be anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 graduating students every year. So you don't hear about those things. They're not as sexy as saying, you know, uh, you know. Microsoft is moving to Fort Lauderdale. You know, you're not going to hear that. Even though Microsoft has a regional headquarters here in Fort Lauderdale, I'm sure a lot of people don't know about that. But the point is that we need to diversify our jobs. We cannot rely on any single type of industry because one thing we learned during COVID, if you rely too much on one industry like we did with hospitality, you really threaten the economic, the economy your community. So we're looking to diversify and we're looking to find more and more jobs in more and more places. Um, I would love to um, open the floor and provide an opportunity to our guests if they have any questions for our panelists. I have a question. Okay. Why are we having this in such a small room? We could have had 140 people here. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I think we actually had an amazing turnout. The amount of people that came in and sold out was incredibly quick. Like we didn't have the, even the opportunity to have a long push for this amazing event, especially when you say Mr. Mayor, Jenny and Megan is gonna be on the panelists. Of course it's gonna sell out in a heartbeat. So we are happy to have you all here. Jay, I would love to have a question from you if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you very much for all the uh, great information. It's very informative. Uh, native of Florida for the last 17 years, so it's really exciting to see what the next 10 years is gonna, gonna be like. One of the things that uh, I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about too is, since Fort Lauderdale, let's face it, is, is the hub, so it's, it's the shiny penny of, of sort of the greater Broward area, what type of connectability are we looking forward to in the future that connects the east side to the west side of Broward. Because, you know, we talk a lot about how to connect the downtown to the beach, but as we all know, and certainly the realtors in the room know, is we have a lot of people live outside of, of Fort Lauderdale, but always commute into Fort Lauderdale. And of course, this is where they want to come to enjoy their, their fun time. And that creates an enormous amount of, of uh, congestion uh, coming through, you know, 595, uh, 95 and then obviously through our arteries that uh, come into the downtown area as well too. Thank you Jay for your question. You're asking the wrong people. <laughs> so Fort Lauderdale ends at 31st Avenue, right? And I have been, I've been a resident of this area for 40 years and I've been asking the same question. Uh, even before Weston was built, I was saying, how are those people gonna to get to Fort Lauderdale, right? And what do we do? We just build more highways, right? When we have opportunities to build rail, where is that, right? I guess the rail lobbyists weren't as strong as the highway lobbyists, and that's why we have what we have. It's, it's, it's an embarrassment that a community of two million people, we're larger than, what, a dozen states or more, okay, that doesn't have some sort of mass transit system between the west side of the county and the east side, right? So the city of Fort Lauderdale has learned that the county has somewhere in their plans to, to build east-west um, um, uh, east west system, okay? Um, no one knows what, what it is, no one knows where it's going, uh, no one knows how much it's gonna cost, and no one knows when it's gonna be implemented. We do know that they've been talking about it, okay? Um, but uh, maybe Jenny knows more. <laughs> but I'm not gonna put her on the spot. But like I said, you're asking the wrong people because we have been begging for that. Because the thing about traffic in Fort Lauderdale is it's generated from two sources. One is local people who, going, who live downtown or live in one of the neighborhoods like Victoria Park and, uh, and have to travel to work or have to travel to what where they wanna go eat out or whatever. And we can mit we can mitigate that by by like I said earlier by uh, having people live downtown and work downtown so people don't have to get out of their cars uh, or to get into their cars to to go where they want to go. But we also have traffic that's generated from commuters, so the commuter traffic adds thousands and tens of thousands of more cars to our roads every single day, both both not just during rush hour but during the course of the day. So how do we start to minimize that? We have been begging for some kind of commuter line between the east side and the west side of the county for very, very long, long before I ever came into office. So um, for some reason, they just can't seem to get, get it through. Not because the county doesn't have the resolve, but, because, but also because um, there are cities along the way that don't want trains through their city. Like Davey, both Davey in particular has been pushing back on that for the longest time. So. That's where tunnels come in. <laughs> because uh, the Boring Company has said, do you know that there's 88,000 trips between downtown Fort Lauderdale and the west, and those campuses, the college campuses at Alden Davey, every single day, pre-COVID? 88,000 trips. I spoke to the president of Nova University, and he, he's so on board with putting a tunnel between the city and his campus to eliminate 88,000 car trips on those roads. Imagine how that would eliminate so much traffic. So we've got to embrace these novel ideas. It's not novel technology, just novel ideas to be able to create 
what Jenny said is a quality of life that sometimes outweighs the cost of some of these things. And the cost of some of these things can easily be uh, uh, um, uh, secured through, through you know, paying, uh, paying uh, a per trip ride back and forth, which is not out of people's reach. I mean, the cost of two cocktails. <laughs> anyway, um, that's the answer. Why choose Fort Lauderdale instead of West Palm Beach or Miami? I know that we're going rapidly, but we want to hear from you. Thank you. Well, I, I think it's first nostalgic for me growing up most of my life here in Broward um, County. But definitely that is the geographic center. I have family that's in West Palm Beach. I have family in Miami Beach, Miami. So to be able to be in the center of it all, it means a lot to me, especially for business. Secondly, I love to travel. So being able to be near an international airport, that's, I'm a little biased, much more pleasurable than Miami. <laughs> That's a big win. Um, and you know, I toggled in the past years of, should I move back to Miami? You know, it has the, there's so much construction, this and that. And then every time I'm on 95, when I get back home, I can breathe. You know, it's, it's more of a local vibe. It's not as transient as Miami. I love Miami. I can go to Miami, but then I come back and I truly feel like it's home. And just for me, Victoria Park, we have an amazing holiday park. There's a lot of activity. You're close to the downtown, but you can still have a neighborhood vibe. You can still get to the western regions of Broward. So overall, it's just the, the lifestyle here. It's, it's not as congested, less inventory. I run into people I know. I love the retail offerings. You know, it's not big box stores necessarily. If you're on Las Olas, you're seeing like more thoughtful stores coming and, and that's the majority of why I love living here. I mean I would love to I actually would love to, to hear from you guys on that question. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, so much of what you said, I think, resonates for those of us that grew up here. Um, I had the fortune to also grow up here until I was a teenager. Then we moved to Western Colorado, and I promptly came back when I uh, graduated college out there. And, you know, part of it is because there is that relaxed vibe, but opportunity abounds in so many ways. You know, economic prosperity through the type of jobs that are offered here. Um, the quality of life, you know, you get the big city experience and the access to, you know, an international city of Miami. And Fort Lauderdale is an international city, too. You just talked about the connections, the type of businesses, the people that are here, the diversity. Um, I think it's a place where if you have grit and hustle, you can run and make a difference and really change kind of the direction of the industry that you're in. And there's a lot of collaboration. You know, and I think we're seeing that more on a regional basis. It necessitates it. Issues like transportation and housing and infrastructure. So, you know, sometimes we compete, no doubt. We just talked about why Fort Lauderdale is the center of it all and the best. Um, but it really is a region that has so many strengths that complement one another. So those are some of the reasons why I just love it here. Do you love it here? <laughs> I think it's because of its mayor. <laughs> Well, we are the navel of the sun, <laughs> so we're, we're the center of it all. But, um, uh, but I think I, I echo your, your sentiments. It's, it's simply a, we have a more diverse culture here. And we, uh, you know, over 60 different native languages are spoken in our school system, believe it or not, here in Broward County. Um, and I think because of its diversity, something we pride ourselves on, People find a place for themselves here. No matter who you are, where you come from, where you what you believe, who you love, this is a place for you. And Fort Lauderdale has always uh, attracted people who feel that they needed a home, and Fort Lauderdale has been a home for them. And and it's affordable, and it's fun, and it's exciting, and it's growing, and it's relaxing all at the same time. So. Um, so I think that's a message that I think goes out to everybody, and I think that's the, the main appeal that we have here in our city. 
Thanks. I couldn't agree more. Thank you to the panelists today for speaking and giving us so much knowledge on what is happening in the city of Fort Lauderdale. Thank you so much for joining us today on our city spotlight of Fort Lauderdale. It was incredible to see all of our familiar and new faces. Yes, we had Mayor Dean, Jenny from the DDA, and of course you, Megan, did an amazing job answering our questions and getting us more involved in what's happening in Fort Lauderdale. 